Welcome to Native Yoga Toddcast. So happy you are here. My goal with this channel is to bring inspirational speakers to the mic in the field of yoga, massage, body work, and beyond. Follow us at Native Yoga and check us out at nativeyogacenter.com. All right, let's begin. Welcome. For those of you that are first time listeners, welcome. So happy to have you here. For those of you that keep returning, thank you so much. I really appreciate your support. Today I have the pleasure of introducing you to Shane Dowd. Shane is a certified massage practitioner, a strength and conditioning coach, and a corrective exercise specialist. You can visit him on his website at gotrom.com, G-O-T-R-O-M.com, and then also on a website called thefaifix.com, so T-H-E-F-A-I-F-I-X.com. And I'll have all the links in the show notes below. Make sure you check him out. He's got an incredible YouTube channel. He's gifted uh, I'm so happy to have the conversation with him. I learned a lot. He got me really excited to implement some of the tricks and tips that he speaks of. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's go ahead and begin. I have Shane Dowd here who has a website, gotrom.com, spelled G-O-T-R-O-M.com, and also the fai-fix.com. And Shane, you're joining me. Where are you right now? I am in a rural part of Colombia, in the Andes mountain region. Nice. Quite beautiful. You should come visit. <laughs> wow. I've never been to Colombia, but I always hear amazing things about it. Yeah. There's this little town called Barichara, which is, it's claimed to fame as the cutest town of Colombia. Wow. And, uh, and I live just on the outskirts of that in the countryside. Nice. How long have you lived there? Almost two years now. I wow. got married to a lovely Colombian woman a couple of years ago, and we moved to Barichara about two years ago. And from here, I run my online business and do my stretching and yoga and strength training and all the stuff that we'll probably get into and can do it all from the from the countryside, which is one of the gifts of technology and Wi-Fi. Agreed. That's amazing. Are you originally, obviously, you're from the States. Where, where were you born or where, where, did, where, you, where did you grow up? I grew up mostly in Michigan mm -hmm. um, for a long time. And then after college, I moved to Massachusetts to do a strength and conditioning mentorship with a really high level track and field coach. And, um, and then after that, I moved to California for about six years, got into all the hippy dippy stuff, the, all the stuff that I promised myself as a, as a teenager, I'd never be into like <laughs> yoga, and <laughs> meditation. And, uh, but you know, California sucked me in and I got into all of that. And, uh, I was in California for a while and then now Columbia. Nice. And when I got a chance to per peruse your website, which is amazing, by the way, I highly recommend everyone listening to check out your site, um, I, I got a chance to learn about your story where you mentioned you had uh, an injury that's commonly known as femoroacetabular impingement. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that history and how that happened. Yeah, sure. So I mentioned that I, I had moved to Massachusetts, Boston after college, and that was to start a career as a strength and conditioning coach and a personal trainer. So for several years, I was basically Mr. Weightlifter guy. I was squatting heavy weight, deadlifting, sprinting, training side by side with these Olympic and national level strongman competitors. Like my whole world was sports and lifting weights. Mm. But after I moved to California, I was in a, I was a coach in a CrossFit gym and I was doing some Olympic weightlifting and I ended up hurting my back really, really bad. So bad that my girlfriend at the time had to put on my socks and shoes for about a month oh, after yeah. that injury because I physically couldn't couldn't do it. Um, and that led me to change from Mr. Weightlifting Guy, whose whole life revolved around sports and lifting weights, to the flexibility side, the rehabilitation side. I studied you know, hours and hours a day of 
physical therapy and yoga, started going to yoga every day. And in the beginning, even things like child's pose, which the teacher informed me, child's pose is the resting position in yoga. And I was like, no, this position hurt for me. Oh, yes. And uh, I, was, I was in bad shape. I was in bad shape after that injury. But, but slowly but surely, the yoga really helped. The physical therapy that I was studying really helped. The corrective exercises, I became a corrective exercise specialist. I went back to school to become a massage therapist. And I basically transformed myself from the world of sports performance and lifting weights to the world of rehabbing injuries and becoming like a flexibility and mobility teacher. Wow. And, um, and you know, that's the, the quick summary of kind of how I made that tradi- that transition. And now that's a combination of those two worlds is now what I help people with today. But, but the reason why I actually had that injury in the first place, as I researched more and got x-rays and MRIs and saw doctors, it turns out that I have a condition called femoral acetabular impingement which basically just means one of my hip bones is oddly shaped and that causes a lot of pain or it can cause a lot of pain and movement restrictions. And normally they say that the only option to resolve that uh, is to get surgery. Mm. So I was 26 at the time and I was like, well, that seems way too young to get surgery. And so I just did all those, all the yoga, all the massage, all the stretching disciplines, um, lots of physical therapy and, basically found a way to come out of that problem without surgery. Wow. And that's where the FAI Fix program was born. Um, and that's when I started teaching people how to fix pain and injuries in general. How common is it to have um, FAI or, or that impingement or to have a, it sounds like you said that you were born with uh, your maybe the hip is a little bit off. It was it something that was congenital, or is it something that happened due to the accident? Um, it it it's hard to say because I yeah. never got an X ray or, or an MRI when I was much younger when there was no problems going on. So I don't know if I've always had that bone shape. Yeah. But um, but I do know that FAI is more common in, in certain sports. Mm. So I played soccer growing up. So I did a lot of kicking, a lot of soccer, a lot of cutting. Um, and that tends to be pretty aggressive on your hips in general. And if you have an underlying predisposition, like say your, your bones aren't ideally shaped, or maybe there's just some overuse that goes on, or you mm. played, you know, too much soccer without a rest, or you've had some injuries in the past, which we all had, you know, as young people growing up playing sports, there's these injuries yeah. that we forgot we even had, but they, they often are there. And so, um, yeah, it happened for me, I think, because of a combination of playing soccer my whole life, probably genetics, and then probably after I stopped playing soccer, I sw- switched to another very hip and back intensive sport, which is Olympic weightlifting, where you have to, you know, clean mm. or snatch mm. a very heavy weight over your head all in one motion, mm. and you're dropping down into a rock bottom squat, supporting your, you know, maybe your body weight yeah. or more over your head. And so that's a very, you know, I, the, the problem was I had stiff ankles, stiff hips. I'd never done any kind of flexibility or mobility training. Mm. And then I tried to put heavy weights and fitness on top of that sort of asymmetrical um, and not very flexible body. And yeah. it was just kind of a, a recipe for disaster. So I think that's probably why it eventually caught up with me at 26. Wow. Is it... When you got had doctors look at you, is it something that they did they say that you like tore a muscle or that you had like uh, like tendonitis or when you say the impingement, is it that the hip shifted really radically while you're holding and like the hip slipped out and then caused like a pinch on a nerve that caused you to be unable to move or do you have insight into what you think happened? muscularly or in, in that vein? Yeah, well, oddly enough, I mean, this will make a lot of sense to you given what you do, but, you know, oftentimes the uh, site of where the problem is is not necessarily where the pain is. So right. I actually ended up having a lot of low back pain because mm. my right hip was so tight and immobile. Mm. And so um, I, I had these like recurring SI joint injuries and that's, you know, that was that back injury that I was describing yeah. that led me down the exploration of, well, why does my back keep getting injured over and over again? Gotcha. And as I started getting into yoga, I started realizing that there was all kinds of poses that I could do 
okay on my left and not at all on my right. Mm. So I realized that I was kind of like that car, that proverbial car driving out of alignment where, you know, the alignment on the right side is just way off. I had no mm. hip flexion, no hip extension, no external rotation, internal rotation. I couldn't get into pigeon pose, couldn't get into any of the poses on my right side. Mm. And that was eye opening to me because I, I had never tried the yoga poses before, but going into, when you, when you go through a sequence of yoga poses, as you know, you're, you're going to find out where you can't go. And mm-hmm. so, um, that was, that kind of clued me into that. But what was happening sort of on the, in the joint itself is that, you know, the bone was, this is, this is a sort of prevailing theory or the most common theory is that the bone is, is poorly shaped over time. The wear and tear of that grinds on the hip labrum and can cause a labrum tear. Mm. And then there becomes this instability in the hip that, you know, you can't control. Mm. Um, and that causes bigger tears and it causes muscles to sort of clench around there because there's not this, this inherent instability in the hip. And so the muscles have to overcompensate to, um, to try to create some stability. Yeah. And, um, and it leads to this sort of vicious circle of like tightness and instability and pain and tightness and instability and pain. And they say that the only way to rectify that is to change the bone shape, mm. repair the labrum, and then that's going to fix everything. Yeah. But unfortunately, you know, you can go on online forums and find out about people who have had surgery for hip impingement, and it's not quite the slam dunk home run guarantee that it's presented sometimes. Gotcha. Um, just like just like surgery, many other surgeries throughout medical history, you know, they say, "Oh, your knee's hurting. There's something we need to cut. We need to get in there and do something to it." Yeah. Um, and it's it's not always just a hundred percent guarantee. It's not to say that surgeries never work. They certainly can for certain people, yeah. but um, they shouldn't be the first choice um, because they're more invasive and more expensive. And there's a lot of things that you can try before that, like yoga, like physical therapy, like strength training, like massage, like a combination of all of those. And so, yeah, basically, you know, I have a labrum tear, a bone cyst, uh, what's called cam impingement, which means the the neck of my femur is a little bit too thick mm. and all, all of that plus never doing any mobility work and, and um, any kind of flexibility work mm. was sort of the, the root causes of my particular problems. Well, what was, what's amazing to me when I saw some of the photos and videos that you have on your YouTube channel and on your website, you have been able to, uh, achieve a level of hip flexibility that is remarkable. Um, I'm curious, like, how did you go from having such a like athletically orientated practice? And you said you you went what, that was more about strength and not as much about mobility. And then you said you went into yoga, but um, most people when they start doing yoga aren't able to achieve that level of flexibility. Can you give us some insight into how you're able to do that? Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of like the journey happened where after I got past the first stages of basically like coming out of pain, restoring what I would call just like uh, a decent level of hip mobility, Mm -hmm. I was like, hold on, all the doctors are telling me and the x-rays and the MRIs are telling me that my problem was caused by a bone and the only way to ever improve the mobility and fix the pain is with by fixing the bone, but I'm already out of pain and I've already improved the mobility to a degree. Mm. And I got really curious, like, I'm going to see how far I can push this. Of course, mindfully, I'm not going to like try to force my way into the splits if I'm just doing more damage. But I was like, I'm in, I'm interested in training for the splits and just seeing how far I can take it. And so started just doing lots and lots more mobility work, stretching. I studied yoga, studied gym, gymnastics style stretching, started studied loaded stretching where you use weights to stretch, started use, um, studying ballistic stretching, which is a style of stretching that they use in kung fu and wushu and martial arts training where they do little tiny bounces while they're doing things. Mm. And I also at that time went back to school to become a massage therapist. I met a masterful body worker named Phil in California who had been doing 35 years of just deep tissue body work. And in his office, he had a shelf, like a bookshelf full of massage tools. And he started introducing me to all these different strange looking gadgets and gizmos that when I started using them on my body, it started making my stretching that much more effective because 
it's kind of like chewing up bubble gum before you stretch it. It just mm. tends to stretch yeah. better. So yeah. the combination of the really targeted deep myofascial massage work plus the stretching from these different disciplines and then a little bit of um, strength training seemed to be the optimal combination for me yeah. that allowed me to get into some of these deeper splits, side splits, pancake splits, back bridges, front splits, all that fun stuff. Um, and I don't think that I would have been able to get there if I hadn't especially found the, what I call like targeted tissue work or like really precise precision massage, or you might call it trigger point therapy style massage that you do on yourself with a lot of um, different tools, yeah. not just yeah. a foam roller, not just yeah. one lacrosse ball, but a variety of different tools. And so that combination of chewing up and softening up the tissues unlocked some some stretches and some range of motion, some ranges of motion. And um, I think that's what allowed my hip mobility to kind of go to the next level where I could actually do things like the splits and stuff like that. Nice. That's awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm excited to um, actually sign up for one of your courses and, and start learning <laughs> some of this because I, 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 I know the benefits of all these, but I'm so curious to, to, to learn some of the tricks that you've learned over the years. Um, you made mention when you said, okay, I, I've been able to do, uh, I've been able to achieve this. I wonder how far I can take it. And often when some, when we're at least in the yoga world, either learning to do splits or practicing that moving in that direction of learning to do splits and, or that type of hip mobility. Um, and the question arises is like, how do I now, how do I know when I'm doing too much? How do I, and Pain usually is the answer. I know. I know there's the idea that we'd like to avoid pain in the process of trying to achieve that mobility. But what kind of advice would you give somebody who's perhaps a little bit newer to yoga? They're feeling like they have really tight hips and they're curious, like, how do I know how far I can push it without doing damage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, I think it's important in the beginning of the journey to don't try so hard. I remember a yoga teacher telling me, he was like, when you come to yoga class, give it like 50% effort. Yep. And I was like, that sounds so counterintuitive to me because I come from the sports world where you give 110% effort. <laughs> and so now you're yeah. telling me to give 50% effort. That makes no sense. But I saw the wisdom of that as I practice more and more, because if you are trying to force your way into deeper ranges, especially if you've got something, you know, off in your hips, some kind of bony deformity or something that's just different, um, you can you can hurt yourself by trying to help yourself, by trying to stretch deeper and deeper and getting into the mindset that deeper is better, deeper yeah. means I'm going to feel better, deeper means I'm going to move better, deeper means I'm going to be more healthy. And I don't think that's the case at all. I think that you need as much range of motion as you need for your life and sports and activities. And if you don't need a whole lot of range of motion, you might not need to get into the splits or... Yeah. Yeah. In really, really deep poses. So that advice of like give it 50% effort in the beginning is yeah. one really helpful tip for the beginners. Mm -hmm. I think as you become more advanced, you can push the limits a little bit more because you know your body a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. But it should always be done with mindfulness and with body awareness. And so I think the second thing is that when I started coming out of all of this pain and injury that I was having, at the same time, very fortunately, I started – a meditation practice mm. and it was a uh, Vipassana style meditation which is sort of a, a body centered sensation based you know be, your, your object of meditation is your own body and of course your mind but yeah. but yeah. primarily the sensations of your body and that that practice over time where I would go to these 10 day retreats or 20 or 30 or 45 day retreats or longer and also meditate you know daily helped me to sort of develop what I call inner IQ, like this inner awareness, this somatosensory, uh, interioceptive inner awareness. And because I was meditating on what I was feeling in my body, plus doing all of this body-based practices of stretching and strengthening and massaging my body, it's like my, my awareness of what was happening in my body and what my body was asking for and what it wanted and what it did not want me to do. Nice. just grew exponentially over a 10, 12 year period. And so I think that the second tip besides um, give it 50% effort in the beginning and just, you know, take it easy in the beginning is 
have some sort of a mindfulness meditation type practice. And if you're not someone who's interested in seated meditation, at the very least, you can just keep your eyes closed while you're practicing your yoga or your stretching and relax your face, relax your breath, and just tune in to what you're feeling. Because so often I and people that I've coached do their stretching practices while multitasking and doing something else. Maybe they're listening to a podcast, maybe they're watching TV, (laughs) maybe they're doing something else. And the quality of your work is just not going to be the same. So so developing that inner awareness, that inner IQ, that mindfulness um, will help you not overdo things and make your, your practice a lot more effective too. That's a great recommendation. I appreciate that. Did, um, do you sit or are you involved with the Guenka lineage in your Vipassana practice? Yeah, yeah, Not, exactly. Yeah. Nice. I, I enjoy, I, I've done a, a couple of 10 day sits myself. I, I love it. It's amazing. Are you getting ready to go sit sometime soon? Yeah, well, Earlier at the end of last year, we just got back from a long course, and now on Monday we're going to serve a course. We're going to go volunteer on a course. Nice. What's the what was the duration of the last course that you sat? That was a long course. Um, that one was forty five days. Whoa, Shane! <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, dude! I oh. I mean, for anyone listening, I highly, highly recommend to check out dhamma.org, which I'll put that in the show yeah. notes as well. And um, so the, the method that uh, you're mentioning, I mean, to, to, to even be able to sit a 45-day course, you have to be practicing pretty diligently for a fair amount of time. Is that correct? Yeah, there's certain requirements. <laughs> yeah. <we have> to, <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> yeah, man. you can't just raise your hand and say, "I oh. want to do that." You have certain requirements. Yeah, so yeah. Me. I mean, I, after ten days, when I I met a, a senior teacher that had told me he had finished, um, I believe it was a is it a sixty day? Is that like the long? Yeah. And I just, yeah, I, so I was just blown away. Like after 10, I was like, oh my gosh, what was <laughs> that? And he's like, yeah, I did a 60 day this year. And I was like, my mind was blown. I was like, I don't even, holy cow. But obviously you build up to it. But that is amazing, Shane. That takes a lot of uh, uh, just just perseverance, but also, like you said, just being really patient. And uh, <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah. Well, that's such a cool blend to that makes perfect sense. If somebody is um, rushing it and the ego is getting involved, then I would agree 100 percent that taking time to slow down and get in touch with what's going on would would be a great solution to working through these issues. I'm I'm curious what your thoughts are on, say, if I pick a pose like Baddha Konasana, which is where if we sit on the floor and we have our feet together and our knees open up and say the right hip is really flexible and it goes down pretty low, but the left hip is the knee is much higher. What is your philosophy or approach to um, trying to get the tighter side to open and then i guess i'm curious uh like put 10 minutes in on the really tight side and only five on the easy side or um you know if if i have really great range of motion on one side and then really limited on the other sometimes i might always play to my good side and because of the tight side hurts so bad i try to avoid it do you have a, a strategy for working with this totally yeah yeah and that's a perfect example because i mean 12 years ago when i was first starting all of this stretching and yoga and meditation and mindfulness journey that was one of the poses that was just utterly impossible for me and i thought it would never be normal because you know another name for that pose uh, is often called butterfly pose where maybe you're sitting with your mm-hmm. back against a wall or not with your back against a wall, feet together, and let your knees fall out. And on my right side, it felt like a hard, bony stop. It felt like this yep. is brick wall against brick wall. Yep. And the average therapist or physical therapist or other teacher would probably say, well, don't force that because you have FAI, it's bone on bone, so don't even try to improve that because you're just going to cause more damage. And if I would have listened to that, I never would have explored it mindfully. And so what I found that specifically helps 
that, of course, respecting your your limits that day, mm-hmm. is doing some some targeted tissue work on sort of the high quad attachment points and hip flexor attachment points at the top of the hip, and doing tissue work on your adductor attachment points. Which to be able to do that, you'll need some specialized tools. There's you can put a lacrosse ball on a box and you kind of throw your leg up on top of it and you look like a dog peeing on a fire hydrant. That's mm. the position you're in. Yeah. And then you sort of do some cross fiber friction, some targeted massage on the adductor attachment points. I actually invented a tool, a wooden stick that looks like, you know, the, the policemen in England, they carry that like baton. Yeah. I, I invented a wooden tool that looks like that, that helps me to get into those adductors because that was one of my problem areas. And that was one of, the keys to unlocking that pose for me because you can't really foam roll your groin, your adductor yeah. attachment points. Yeah. And most massage therapists either don't want to go into that area because it's personal yeah. or they don't have the skill or the confidence to really get into those attachments because it's way up there in your groin. And so yeah. often you need to do it on your own. Yeah. So I, I invented like four or five ways of using a kettlebell or a barbell in the gym or the hip stick tool or a lacrosse ball in a box to massage those adductor muscles. And after I did that, that pose started to open up for me. Interesting. So yeah. that was one thing. And yeah. then the other thing is um, loaded stretching. Like actually in certain poses, I like using external weights. Mm. So imagine me sitting with my back against the wall, my feet together, my knees falling out to the side in that, in that pose. And then taking some, it could be 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 pound weights if you're a a bigger, stiffer person, and mm. you're comfortable with that, mm-hmm. and just resting them on the edge of your knees mm. with a slight external rotation force that seems to make it more comfortable for mm. certain people. Yeah, I know we're getting into the nerdy, nitty gritty details, but <laughs> I love it. Do it, please. Um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but that 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 sort of that loaded butterfly stretch, which I have some videos about on my YouTube, plus yeah. the the prior tissue work on the adductors and maybe the 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 high quad attachment points really makes that pose feel a whole lot better for me. Wow. Great advice. All right. That's cool. Um, when you said like brick wall though, so maybe it was like the feeling that was on the back side of the hip, like you said, like bone on bone, but you're saying that was once you started to press on the attachment sites of the inner thigh muscles, the adductor muscles, that that alleviated that kind of bone on bone feeling on the, on the backside. Is that true? Did I hear that? Okay, cool. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think the theory would be that, you know, there's all these muscles that attach in and around the ball and the socket of the hip. And if some of them are pulling extra tight, they can pull the hip out of position. And in my body, what it feels like is that the hip is not quite as centrated. It's not quite as centered in the socket. Mm. And then therefore, maybe maybe it is in fact sort of like bone coming closer to bone and contacting bone. But if I can release the muscles via the deep targeted tissue work mm. um, and learn how to contract and centrate the hip using my own muscle contractions, mm-hmm. um, then the combination of that it seems like it puts the, the ball in a better fit position in the socket and therefore mm. it rolls and slides and glides a lot better. Nice. In the case of someone who is standing with feet together and they forward bend, uh, much like to either tie their shoes, touch their toes, and they bend their knees, they bend at the hips, and they try to bring their chest down onto their thighs, and they feel like they hit that brick wall that you mentioned before on the front and often it seems like, well, wouldn't it be the hamstrings that the back of the legs, if that's tight, that would limit that forward flexion of the hips. But sometimes the complaint is the discomfort kind of at the, the front of the hip. What, what would be your thoughts there? Uh, there's like a checklist of like 20 things that I would go through in my mind. <laughs> yeah. Sorry to be so specific, yeah. but this is, I'm just thinking of different students that have come in and, and I didn't have a good answer for them. Like I, like I, sure. my go-to thought would be, you know, hamstrings and posterior muscles. But I love that you've brought up in terms of with the, the bound angle or the, the, the feet together, knees opening the working of the, you know, inside, the inside work, 
even though it felt like maybe it was being locked up on the posterior. Is this a similar type of situation? Yeah, yeah. I, I always, I'm a very sort of systematic thinker. So the my framework for approaching anything is what I call the TSR method, which stands for tissue work, stretching, and re-education, or you can think of it as tissue work, stretching, and strengthening. So when it comes to forward folding, my first thought would be, yes, the, the hamstrings. Can we do tissue work on the hamstrings? Mm-hmm. Yes, with a, a ball a ball on a box is my preferred way. There's also ways where you can put a barbell in a gym and you kind of sit on it like almost like uh, the bar is going um, horizontally across your body mm-hmm. and you are putting one leg forward and one, one leg back like you were about to start going into the splits. The bar mm-hmm. is about sort of thigh, thigh level. Yep. And the bar rests on the middle of your hamstrings and then you start swinging your foot like a pendulum. Uh. And that basically does pin and stretch massage like an ART technique, an ART massage technique on the hamstring muscles. Or a simpler version is just take a softball or some kind of big larger diameter massage ball, put it on a box or a a chair and start to massage your hamstring muscles. There's a very specific body position difference. Usually you have to get in a very wide squat stance. You can't just sort of have your legs very narrow. Um, But basically the point is there's ways of massaging and chewing up your hamstring muscles, Mm. which then when you stretch them afterwards in a variety of ways will start to allow you to forward fold more and more comfortably, especially as you get better and better at the massage. Yeah. And you experiment with a variety of different ways of stretching the hamstrings because there's so, so many ways to stretch the hamstring. Um, and then there's also one thing that I learned from physical therapy is using these big uh, elastic bands that people use in gyms to do like assisted pull-ups that they can't do pull-ups on their own. Yeah. We can use those bands to distract the hip. So in this case, I would uh, have the band attached around my hip. It's pulling directly behind me. It's attached to a pole and it's pulling backwards or distracting backwards. Yeah. And then I, and then I do some sort of like forward fold ham, hamstring type stretches and the band will actually glide the hip or the, glide um, mm-hmm. the femur back in the socket a little bit and that will allow you to sort of like hinge over your pelvis or fold forward a little bit more cleanly and nice. yeah. stretch a different part of your hamstrings that normally you wouldn't get if you didn't have that band distracted technique. So it's like we can chew up the muscle with massage. We can do some band distracted techniques if you feel like something's catching in there. And then of course you can always lengthen the backside, which is the, the, the stretching of the hamstrings, but you can also strengthen the front side. So strengthening the quads and the hip flexors to pull you deeper into the position can sometimes be helpful for some people. Yep. It's kind of like um, that makes sense. not only just releasing the brakes, which is releasing the hamstrings with massage and stretching, but also learning how to step on the gas, meaning how to get stronger quads to pull you deeper into the forward folding kind of hamstring stretch. There's some people that take that line of thought to the extreme and they say, don't stretch your hamstrings, just strengthen your quads. Don't mm. wish you had fle- mm. more flexible hamstrings, wish you had stronger quads. And they just do all kinds of exercises to strengthen the quads. Yeah, I think a mix of both is usually ideal. Gotcha. That, that makes me um, quite, uh, curious if you started off in the really – strong or strength based practices in sports. And then you got really deep into stretching and opening with these different assisted massage techniques with stretching. Where are you at these days with your own personal exercise and physical movement practice? What, what has, where, where, what's resonating the most for you now? Um, well, no surprise that I, given that I'm into meditation, that I chose something that's kind of middle path for me <laughs> when I was, when I was too far on the strength training side, I was unbalanced. Mm. And then for several years I swung way at the pendulum swung way over to the, uh, stretching and flexibility and hardly any weight training side. And I found that I got almost too mobile it's like it's like my body wanted a little bit more stability a little bit more muscle mass a little bit more strength Mm -hmm. and so i kind of settled into this middle point where you know my 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 weekly routine is probably five or six days of a combination of walking in nature going for runs in nature and then coming back and doing a little bit of strength training in my house but 
my strength training is always now combined with stretching and mobility work. So it's mm. like they're one in the, they're one in the same to me. It's like I'll do a set of push-ups or squats or you know lunges or something supersetted with some sort of stretching or self massage exercise. So it's like it's always strength stretch, strength stretch, strength massage, strength massage, nice. and that combination keeps yeah. my body feeling basically ready for anything. Like if I need to pick up a refrigerator to move it with some friends or something, I can do that because I'm practicing, you know, being strong enough to do that and, and knowing the technique of how to lift heavy things. But then I'm also taking care of the suppleness of my tissues with the massage and also taking care, making sure that I'm always talking to my ranges of motion, my, my back bridging, my, you know, splits like positions. Like I don't, I don't go into the full splits um, that often anymore because I don't really need that for my daily life. I don't need to have the yeah. side splits and the pancake splits and the front splits to be able to live just a active, healthy life. I like to every once in a while I'll, I'll get excited to you know do them again and I'll, I'll you know train hard on them for a couple of weeks just to make sure that they're still there. But it's um, yeah, it's kind of a, a blend of things now. Every day is a little massaging, a little stretching, a little strengthening, a little nature time nice i'm 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 curious if you're when you were sitting for that long you know for a long course but even if it was say a short course and uh i found it to be especially when i first started extremely painful um mm. i remember i was traveling and i met a yoga teacher and there was someone in the room who was had very tight hips and he's he he actually this is before i'd I'd heard about Vipassana or, or sitting in, lo in longer retreat settings and, and him saying, you need to go and just sit on the floor for 30 days because, you know, that would be the best way to get your, your hips to open up. Um, would you agree with that? I mean, I, I think that seems obvious that sitting on the floor versus on chairs is going to be good for the hips. But I, I found that sitting for like those 10 hours, a little bit longer than 10 hours a day to be so challenging have have you reached a point oh, yeah. where where you can sit um you know throughout a day and and be able to like walk away from it and feel like that was no problem at all <laughs> or have you gotten to that point where you're that, that uh, there's that much equanimity yeah. that <laughs> yeah. well it, it's it's both it's both the the mental equanimity that definitely uh, you develop over 10 years of practicing it pretty yeah constantly yeah so it's like my body my mind has definitely calmed down and it doesn't react to discomfort in my body as mm. severely as it used to but i actually sat in a chair for my first two vipassana courses oh, and wow. i sat on a bench for the for the following three years or so so it took me about five years before i could actually sit wow. comfortably cross-legged on the on the ground wow um but i'm a very patient or stubborn if you want to call it person and so I just kept kept trying kept trying and I, I remember in like 2018 or 17 maybe I went to India to sort of do this pilgrimage to visit the sites of the Buddha's life and things like that and there was a teacher there who just kept gently encouraging me to keep trying, keep trying. Cause I, I was like, I can't sit cross-legged. Like I'm physically not capable. I was like, you don't understand. Like I've got this FAI in my head. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and she was like, yeah, could be so, could be so, but keep trying. And, uh, and something clicked there. I don't know if I changed my technique a little bit. I do think that there's, there's a, a technique to make sitting more comfortable. I have a video on my YouTube channel about how to sit for meditation with perfect posture or something like that. And uh, it explains a way of sitting cross-legged for people that maybe aren't totally built for it. Mm. Um, so I think that, one, my, my brain has just gotten more chilled out over 10 years of meditating. Two, my technique has improved. And I'm okay if I switch between a kneeling position and a sitting position because when you're on retreat and you're meditating like 10, 12 hours a day in a seated position sometimes, yeah. Um, any position is, is going to be difficult to sit for, for that long, especially if you're, you're really not built for it so well, like a lot of Westerners are. And yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Oh man, I hear you. Awesome. I, I love hearing cause you know, right away when I hear that, that you've been at it and practicing diligently for so long, I just imagine you're just, you know, able to sit so comfortably. So to hear that you've had to work 
so hard at it or you've had to put so much time in as um, comforting in a way or just reassuring that <laughs> there's hope for us. <laughs> there's some hope. Yeah. What, when I when I look at um, I, we have two websites and the Got Rom seems to have a a lot of information on all these different things that you've spoken of and then it seems with your website the fafix dot com seems very specific to the the femoral acetabular impingement. Can you give me a, a little bit more understanding about what you're attempting to do with the FA? I fix approach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that, that program was born out of my personal journey out of that specific problem. So I had hip impingement. I had the FAI discovered all these kind of strange, different ways of healing it that you're not going to find in most physical therapy sessions or almost anywhere um, because it came out of a personal just dire need to, to heal myself. Yeah. Um, but I, I created that program with uh, a partner who also had a lot of um, hip problems and we got together one day and just said like, hey, you know, but the people you're talking to, are you noticing that they're having this problem, hip impingement, these hip impingement problems? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, me too. And so we created that as our, as our first program together. And so that's sort of a standalone, just helping people with FAI, with hip impingement, with hip problems. And that's the FAI Fix website. And then the Got Rom website is what happened after, which is a much broader umbrella where I help people with any kind of physical pain in their body. Well, maybe not any kind of pain, but any of the major injuries and pains that people have, you know, plantar fasciitis, foot pain, knee pain, low back pain, sciatica, shoulder pain, neck pain, all the major pains that people have. I've got a whole uh, university, it's called Fix Injury University, um, series of programs about physical pain because I've had so much of it. Mm. And uh, and then the other side is the flexibility side um, the, yeah. um, where I teach people how to do the splits, how to do a back bridge, how to... I mean, there's also simpler programs like desk posture therapy where I just help the average office worker who knows that their posture is not good from sitting all day and just wants a simple program to help with posture um, or just, you know, uh, the hamstring flexibility program for people that want to touch their toes or the hip flexor flexibility program for people that know their hip flexors are tight. So basically there's fixed injury university and there's flexibility university. Mm. And those are all housed under gotrom.com. Nice. I saw a testimonial on your site where a woman that was having issues that her, her surgeon recommended her to try your FAI fix before having surgery and that's pretty amazing. Like if you can get a, a doctor to um, respect the work that you're doing and say, look, we could do surgery, but um, try this out first. That's, that's incredible. That's a, that's an accomplishment. Well done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And thanks, thanks to that forward thinking doctor, because yeah, I don't know how many doctors would be so, so open to trying, you know, in my mind, at least uh, the, the doc, if someone comes to a doctor the doctor is going to tell them either I can operate on you or you can go to physical therapy. Here's a, here's a referral to the physical therapy. Mm. So to have a doctor who's tried out our program and, and recommends it is definitely a blessing. That's really cool, man. I hear you. Do you have, or have you, uh, I'm guess I'm wondering if when you do you have students and or people you work with that have had the surgery, didn't get the results that they had hoped for and you've been able to help them rehab and be pain-free after surgery as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's why on the FAI Fix website, one of the of the first things you see on the website is that this can potentially help you pre-surgery or post-surgery mm -hmm. because unfortunately, not everyone gets the results that they're looking for yeah. out of the surgery. Some people do. Definitely some people get, get, get benefit from the surgery, but um, some people after the surgery on their hips, they feel like I feel the same or... God forbid, I feel worse. And so um, I say that whether before or after a surgery, for the rest of your life, it's probably a good idea to be have some degree of massaging your body, stretching your body, and strengthening your body. Like if you don't have a self-care practice that includes those three things, I mm. think you're probably missing out on something that could be really helpful for you. Mm. 
So, uh, so yeah, definitely after the surgery too, we have people that, you know, maybe after the surgery, the surgeon just said, okay, like you're good to go, but they were never, you still have to like take care of your muscles after yeah. the surgery. And, yeah. um, and so, yeah, they find that once they start getting into some of the tissue work exercises, the, the gentle, very gentle, all of it is very gentle after surgery, but, but you can start with gentle movement, gentle stretching, gentle strengthening, gentle massage after a surgery. Nice. Do you feel like it's something that once uh, we learn the techniques that you're talking about, that then create creativity comes into play and we can almost start to learn how to figure it out ourselves once we get a couple of the tools in place? Because it's, I'm guessing that you obviously learned a lot of this from other people that you came across, but then just when, since you've mentioned putting the like the lacrosse ball on the box and getting my leg up like a dog and <laughs> getting the getting it right there on those <laughs> attachment points at the where it's where my hip is where it's bothering me. I'm thinking, uh, the world is my oyster now. Like, where else could I? What <laughs> what other areas could I start working on? Did you find that that's the case for you as as you've been um, using these approaches? Totally. Yeah. I mean. I think that goes for anything like in, in the beginning of let's say your yoga practice or when you're starting to learn about self massage in the beginning, it's all a little bit like, I don't know, this is big and complex and confusing, but, um, just the power of human pattern recognition, like you start to practice things long enough and you start to develop an intuition. You start to develop like, oh, okay, like I, I, I've now done enough yoga poses and I followed the recipe of the teacher where they tell me do this, do this, do this, do A, B, C. At some point you start to be able to just freestyle more. You start to be able to improv mm -hmm. and just, you know, do what your body is asking for, not just follow the recipe of the teacher. And um how quickly that comes depends on how immersed you are in studying something. Mm -hmm. The more you immerse yourself in it, like I in the beginning was doing I actually changed my entire I was a personal trainer in a gym and so I had personal training clients and overnight I just kind of like canceled half of those clients or changed a lot of them to mobility clients so that I could spend three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours a day teaching them mobility and at the same time doing it on myself because if I'm teaching someone how to use a ball to massage their body, I'm not going to sit there for two minutes while they're massaging themselves, I'm going to get on the ground and massage my body with them mm. because I can, I can demonstrate it better. Yep. And I also get this extra work done. And so, um, I think the intuitive sort of what my body needed next in terms of the massage came fairly quickly for me because I was just full immersion, deep diving into this stuff mm. in the beginning. Mm. But regardless, whether it happens fast or slow, I think everyone starts to develop, um, and intuition over time about what their body needs. Yeah. And the amazing thing about it is in the long run, you develop a skill set where all of a sudden you start to feel like, oh, I've, I've now developed this skill of massaging my body, this skill of stretching it, this skill of strengthening it. And I, if an if a injury or a problem comes up, there's a good chance, there's an 80 to 90% chance that you're going to know really quickly how to fix it because mm. you've taken the time to, to yeah. develop that yeah. wisdom. Nice. That's cool. If if someone were to come to you today and say, okay, can you do a 60-minute bodywork session for me? And, and in their mind, they're envisioning climbing up on a massage table and you doing like deep tissue work. Do you oblige that and just go for it with a good old-fashioned you know, deep tissue massage? Or do you start to investigate the issue and 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 encourage them to do stretches during the session as well and or some strength training during the session or um how do you approach that now that you have this kind of varied skill set well because i live in rural columbia i don't have any one-on-one -on -one <laughs> clients in my house here Understood. but when i when i yeah. when i when i was a massage therapist in a in a in a trainer in a gym um, I would do a combination. I would do this sort of, it was all over the clothes. It was like very much trigger point style, just like pressure and friction in a sustained kind of way on key areas of dense tissue. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I would very often teach people how to 
mimic what I had just done on themselves mm-hmm. because my goal was to get them as independent as possible yeah. so that they didn't have to rely on anyone else to, yeah. to heal their bodies. And so I, yeah. I just like my, my mentor, Phil, who had that bookshelf full of strange torture looking devices. <laughs> I had that in my, yeah. in my office and I would, and I would show people, here's how you do what I just did to you on yourself. Yeah. And most people find that in the beginning, I am a lot better at working on their bodies because they don't have yet developed the skill. Yeah. But over time, the goal is to get them to where they're their own best healer, they're their own best therapist. That's what happened with me with Phil, where after, say, two years or so, I was like, I actually can get all of my spots that need to be massaged even better than him. I would mm-hmm. still go to see him from time to time because it's just nice to have an extra pair of hands, you know, yeah. helping out, working on you. Yeah. But, um, it's really empowering to reach that level where you're like, I am now my own best massage therapist like, mm. with these tools that I have and these techniques and these body positionings and getting the right angle with the right tool. I can get any, any junky scar tissue sort of cleaned up and, and it makes your body feel tremendously better. Nice. Do you te- I know within the Vipassana tradition, we're discouraged from teaching meditation unless we're you know officially teachers um what are your thoughts on if you were to incorporate teaching meditation through your program do you is that something that you do or do you tend to try to uh tread that line with um you know being respectful of the vipassana tradition yeah yeah i I don't teach meditation i but but i can I can teach sort of meditative principles in very layman terms. So mm-hmm. if I say, relax your face, relax your breath, <sighs> sigh, become dead weight, you know, am I teaching you equanimity, which is from Vipassana, or am I just teaching you to relax and chill out? <laughs> mm, yeah. um, so I, I just use kind of common everyday speak. I, um, if I'm actually massaging someone or stretching them, doing some assisted stretching, I'll use little, you know, micro vibrations because sort of vibration can relax the nervous system, get people to unclench and relax. And so if I'm hands on, I'll kind of um, physically teach them ways of getting their bodies and their nervous systems to drop, to become dead weight, because that's so helpful for both stretching and self massage. Yeah. Um, but I won't, I won't sit down with someone and say, okay, now we're going to meditate. I'm going to teach you how to do this technique. Yeah. I don't, don't do yeah. it like that, but yeah. I can teach them how to, breathe and relax and let go of tension and tightness that they're feeling in their body, that kind of thing. Nice. And then this is a, on the same subject, but maybe just a little slight turn. Um, I personally would like to improve or start working on getting better at doing my, my digital content. And when I look at what you've achieved with your websites and your YouTube station channel, I'm, I'm, uh, just amazed because it takes so much work and so much computing power. Like, just like when I get the idea, like, cool, I want to try to get my YouTube channel going. And then I like realize the camera I need, the type of computer I have to have the, like the microphone and the editing abilities. And how did you do all that? How did you, did you piece, did you kind of approach that the same way that you've learned meditation and being patient with sitting? Or did you have someone like mentor you through all that? Um, yeah, great question. I, I, I started very similar to the meditation with like, you know, in meditation, I was sitting on a chair. Like I was like one of the few people who couldn't <laughs> sit on, on the, on the ground. And I was 26. So it was kind of like embarrassing. It was like me and like old guys sitting in chairs. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so very, very similarly with, you know, starting creating online content and videos and things like that. I just, I had my old iPhone And I just handed it to one of the people in the gym and said, hey, record me. I'm going to talk about stretching for a couple minutes. And I just taught taught something that I had been teaching for years. And uh, and so if you go look back on my YouTube channel at my original videos, they're poor, poor audio, poor video. It's just a shaky cell phone and no microphone. And so I think you got with what you got. And slowly over time, you upgrade your equipment or maybe you, you know, if I, if I was shooting my most professional videos, like my program and product videos, I just hired someone 
for a day or two. And I said, yeah. you're a professional, you know, the lighting, you know, the sound, you bring all the equipment. I don't have to worry about any of that. Yeah. And I'm really glad that I did that in the beginning because I, I did not have the knowledge in the beginning. And yeah. I really relied on them to know what angle, what background, how to get better lighting, how to make sure the sound was good, all yeah. kinds of things that I just were totally outside of my field of awareness. Yeah. And then I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I very much love learning. I'm very autodidactic. I love to read books and take courses and study other people. And so little by little, I just made things better. Eventually, I got my own camera after a couple of years. Eventually, I got a better sound system, yeah. a better microphone. Yeah. I studied what, what makes a good video, what makes a good picture, where does the light need to be coming from, what should the background be, and just sort of picked up the, the principles over time. Nice. But it was a slow, slow process. It's been a seven year journey and it started out with just a, a cell phone and, you know, the other person who worked in the gym. Nice. I appreciate that. That gives me some encouragement. <laughs> they, <Yeah. laughs> oh man, Shane, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. Do we cover most of the bases? Is there anything that I missed? I, I, I'm just curious before we, turn the corner toward towards uh, closing. Is there anything else that you can add to our conversation that you think our listeners can benefit from? Uh, no, I think it's been a really fun conversation <laughs> for me. I appreciate, appreciate you for giving me the space to, to rant and ramble. I, oh, uh, please. I think the only thing, I'll, yeah. only other thing that comes to my mind, just because I know you work with a lot of uh, the yoga population is, I would invite the yoga community to also learn and explore a little bit more about strength training. I mm. think the different, the different worlds, like the, you know, there's like the gym culture where people think that's where all the bodybuilders are and the physical culturists and the yeah. power lifters and, and the yoga community stays over there in their yoga studio and on their mat. And yeah. I just have personally experienced um, a lot of health benefits from, combining the two worlds if you're yeah. a, if you're a yogi and you love yoga and you think of yourself as you know that's your practice cool awesome but also it's helpful I, I in my opinion in the long run in the span of your life learning how to push and pull and move against some resistance it doesn't even have to be heavy weights but just some weight some resistance yeah um seems to have made my body more resilient more healthy and not just Lucy goosey and Gumby like, and, um, my body really likes that combination. So I don't think we talked quite as much about the strength training, but I think it's, uh, another world worth exploring for our, our yogi friends. It's a really good point. When I first started practicing a serious, uh, or, uh, consistent Hatha yoga practice, my teacher at the time I was riding a road bike and when I came in and I was, my legs were tight, he said, you know, you really got to stop, you know, doing everything that's, you know, strength building like that. And, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't take that information well at the time. I, I thought, but man, I love riding my bike. Like I, I, I don't want to quit riding my bike. I did notice that when I stopped riding my bike, I did improve quite a little bit quicker when I stopped getting my legs that yeah. tight. But, um, I, I agree with you. There is a lot of that sentiment where if, you know, you were to go, if you're like a really hardcore yoga person and you go to the gym, someone might look at you like, well, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to be here. And, um, I, I agree with you. I think that that's a, um, that there, there is a lot of benefit. If someone is nervous of weights, do you suggest resistance bands? Yeah. I mean, body weight training, resistance bands are a nice introduction um, the, the nice thing about weights is because they're, they're literally, you know, marked in little increments, you know, mm. 2.5 pounds, five, yeah. 7.5, 10, you can progress in just a really slow and easy kind of way. Like in this day and age, like, I don't care if I'm the biggest and strongest, not at all. I just want to have some strength because I know that in life there's certain things that I want to be able to do for the rest of my life yeah. that require strength that I can't develop on the yoga mat. So I just do very slow. Like if, if I look back at my training records from a couple of months ago, I'm not lifting that much heavier than I was then, but I'm not trying to, I don't care if I squat 300 pounds. I care that I practice the squat pattern against some external load 
so that I develop that coordination and that strength so that when I need to, like I said earlier on this call, pick up a refrigerator or move a box or God forbid, I need to like help move someone who's unconscious for some crazy reason. Yeah. Like I, I have practiced that and I have the physical strength to be able to do so. And I think you, you need a little bit of external load. So progress it in a very slow and easy way. If you can invest in, in, in a coach or, or, or someone to sort of teach you the fundamentals, that can be really helpful nice. in the beginning. And um, yeah, just a nice addition to the overall health and wellness practice of a human being. Agreed. Oh, nice, Shane. Awesome, man. I, I really appreciate uh, having the, you taking the time out of your day to speak with me. And uh, I think you've done an incredible job. I, your journey's uh, really amazing. And uh, this has been a great opportunity for me. And I, I am excited to look at more of your information and, and start implementing some of your ideas. So I, I, I'm really thankful. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been a blast. Awesome. And, uh, I wish you well in your, your next, uh, when you do some service at the, the meditation retreat, that sounds great. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. All right, Shane. Well, thank you. I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. All right. Sounds good. Have a great day. All right. You too. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Remember to check Shane out at his website, gotrom.com. Check out his YouTube channel. You'll be able to find all of the links to his social media from his website. Any of you that would like to practice with us here at Native Yoga Center, we have a two weeks free live stream unlimited that you can find in the show notes linked below. All right. Thanks again. Native Yoga Toddcast is produced by myself. The theme music is dreamed up by Bryce Allen. If you like this show, let me know. If there's room for improvement, I want to hear that too. We are curious to know what you think and what you want more of, what I can improve. And if you have ideas for future guests or topics, please send us your thoughts to info at Native Yoga Center. You can find us at nativeyogacenter.com. And hey, if you did like this episode, share it with your friends, rate it and review, and join us next time.